Close your eyes, watch your breath. Take responsibility for your breath. Be there with it when it comes in. Be there when it comes out. So that you know how it feels. It's when you know how it feels, then you can make changes to make it better. The important point is that you're responsible. Because the breath is coming in and going out all the time. What's going to make the difference here is that the mind engages all the way, takes responsibility all the way. This is a healthy sense of self, the self that feels that he really does want to put it into suffering, and is confident that it can. We were inspired by the Buddhist teachings. He said that we can depend on ourselves, but we have to develop the right qualities inside. So we have to be responsible. To create a healthy sense of self together with our practice. Sometimes we're told that we should have, should have no sense of self as we come to the practice, that if you have a sense of self, you're going to taint the rest of your practice. But that's not the case. As the Buddha said, you, the self has to be its own mainstay. Ultimately, we do get to a point where there's no more need for a sense of self, but that, that's at the end of the path. As we're walking along the path, we have to have a sense that we are competent, we can do this, and we're going to benefit from it. Even in the Buddhist teaching, to let go of things. He says, when you let go of things that are not yours, it will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. You will benefit. So to make ourselves dependable, we have to develop good qualities inside. We can see this, as he says, atahiyatano nato, the self is its own mainstay. We really can depend on itself only when it's got good qualities. This is where we're inspired by another principle, which is that we take the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha as our refuge. And there are many layers of taking refuge. The first one is being inspired by their example. We see that the Buddha was an admirable being, an amazing being. And as I said, the good qualities that led to his awakening, that put an end to his suffering, are qualities that we all have in potential form. And he shows us how we can develop those qualities within ourselves. He himself exemplified three main qualities, wisdom, compassion, purity. And he pointed out how to do that. And in each case, it's having a strong sense of really caring about yourself, wanting to find true happiness for yourself, but doing it in a wise, compassionate, and pure way. So in this way, your sense of self actually does lead to wisdom. It leads to compassion, it leads to purity. If you develop it correctly, you make it a mature self. Look at what the Buddha had to say about how wisdom begins. It begins with a question. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What, will I, when I do it, will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? Notice that there's an I and a me in there. The wisdom in that is, one, you see that your happiness is going to come from your actions. You can't wait for it to come floating by. And secondly, there is such a thing as long-term happiness, and it's better than short-term happiness. There's a passage where the Buddha says that it, the wise person sees that if there's a greater happiness that comes from abandoning a lesser happiness, the wise person will be willing to ab abandon the lesser one for the sake of the greater one. There was a British translator who translated that passage from the Dhammapada, and he put in a footnote that he was confused by this statement, because it just seems so simple and so obvious. Why, does, why do we need a Buddha to tell us that, that you should be willing to sacrifice short term for the long term? Well, the problem is that even though it's obvious, people don't always follow that principle. All too often we go for the short term because it's quick, it's easy. The long term seems hard and far away, so we take what's right at hand. So we have to be reminded that, yes, there is such a thing as long term happiness, and it's really worth the effort that goes into abandoning the lesser happiness. This way we get past that tendency we have to say we're paying, playing chess, to want to win and keep all our pieces at the same time. If you really want to win, you have to be willing to sacrifice some of your pieces. And this is the beginning of wisdom. And then when we ask this question of a wise person, the wise person will point out that we develop happiness through Generosity, virtue, 
developing thoughts of goodwill. These are ways of finding happiness that harm no one. They don't harm you, they don't harm other people, and they create a sense of harmony within the society. If your happiness depends on material gain, status, praise, sensual pleasures, it's going to create divisions. Because with that kind of happiness, one side gains and the other side loses. But with generosity, both sides gain. With virtue, everybody gains. When you develop thoughts of goodwill, everybody gains. Your mind becomes more expansive, and other people are more beneficiaries of your goodwill. Makes them happier, too. Which relates to the second principle, which is compassion. And compassion is not innate in our nature, at least it's no more innate than lack of compassion. It's very easy to have compassion for people we like and not to have compassion for people we don't like. But the Buddha is trying to train us that we have to have compassion for everybody who's suffering. There's a story that goes with this. The King Basanidhi and his queen, Malika, were in their bedroom one day, one-on-one. -on -one. And in a tender moment, the king turns to the queen and says, Is there anyone you love more than yourself? Now you know what he's expecting. Typical king. He expects that she's going to say, Yes, Your Majesty, I love you more than I love myself. And if this were a Hollywood movie, that's what she'd say. But this is not the Hollywood, Hollywood movie, it's the Pali Canon. And in the Pali Canon, people are a little bit wiser, and Malika is especially wise. And she says, no, there's nobody I love more than myself. And how about you? Is there anyone you love more than yourself? And the king has to admit, no, there's nobody he loves more than himself. So that's the end of that scene. The king leaves the apartment and goes down to see the Buddha and reports their conversation. And the Buddha says, you know, she's right. You could search the whole world over and not find anyone you love more than yourself. At the same time, everybody else in the world loves themselves just as fiercely as you love yourself. And the conclusion he draws from that is interesting. It's not that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. He says, you should never harm anyone or cause anyone to do any harm to anyone else. In other words, if you really want to be happy, you should make sure that your happiness doesn't harm anybody, because if it harms other people, they're not going to stand for it. They're going to do what they can to put an end to that happiness. So that way your happiness cannot be long-term. So you have to think about their happiness, too. Make sure that in your actions you don't harm anyone at all. And that way your happiness is not offensive to other people. So here, too, even though we'd like to think of compassion as total abnegation of the self, and actually it comes from wise self-love. If you really love yourself, you have to have compassion for others. Because that way whatever happiness you're looking for in the world, in a righteous way, will last for a long time. So here again, this good quality of the Buddha, like wisdom, compassion comes from having a strong, mature sense of self, learning how to look after yourself in a wise way. It leads to compassion, in a heedful way it leads to compassion. And a similar principle applies to purity. The Buddha taught his son Rahula one time, at that point Rahula was seven, just still newly ordained. And the story goes that he sees the Buddha coming in the distance one day, and so he sets out a jar of water with a dipper for him to wash his feet. The Buddha washes his feet, and he leads, leaves a little bit of water in the dipper. And you get the feeling that Rahula must have told a lie that day, because the very first thing the Buddha talks about is, see how little water there is in the dipper? Yes. That's how little goodness there is in someone who tells a deliberate lie. Has no shame at telling a deliberate lie. Then the Buddha takes the water and throws it away. See how, see how that water is thrown away? Yes. That's what happens to the goodness of someone who tells a deliberate lie with no sense of shame. It gets thrown away. Then he shows him the empty dipper. See how empty this dipper is? Yes, yes, yes. That's how empty of goodness someone is if they can tell a deliberate lie with no sense of shame. So he's established the principle of not lying is important to the practice. And particularly, we're just going to see it's a matter of not lying to yourself. Because then it goes on to say that if you're going to practice, you have to commit yourself and then reflect on what you're doing before, during, and after. Before you do it, you ask yourself, this action that I intend to do, 
would lead to harm for myself or for others. If you see that it will be harm for, harmful for anyone, you don't do it. If you don't foresee any harm, then you go ahead and do it. While you're doing it, you look for the results that are coming out. And if while you're doing it you see that there's some harm, then you stop. If you don't see any harm, you can continue. When the action is done, then you ask yourself, this action that I did, did it cause any harm? And if you see that it did cause harm, you develop a sense of shame around that action and resolve not to repeat it. And if it was an action in terms of your bodily actions or verbal actions, then you talk it over with someone else who is more advanced in the path. And you take their lessons and then you continue training. If you don't see any harm, then as the Buddha said, take pride in the fact, take joy in the fact that your practice is developing. And then continue training yourself day by day. In other words, you take joy in when you've done something right, but you don't rest there. You try to make yourself better. This, the Buddha said, is how purity is found. And it's interesting in each case. There's always an I, this action that I intend to do, this action that I am doing, this action that I have done. If you're going to improve your actions, make them pure, you have to be responsible. So it's in this way that having a strong sense of healthy sense of self, that you realize that you have to be mature in your pursuit of happiness. And a mature pursuit of happiness develops qualities of wisdom, compassion, and purity, which are precisely the qualities of the Buddha himself. So we talk about taking refuge in the Buddha, both as an example and then by taking his qualities and developing them inside. And this is how we do it. We do it by really taking our quest for happiness seriously. We want to do this well. We want to do it in such a way that our happiness is long-term. This is how the practice begins. This is how you learn to be your own mainstay. This is how you develop those qualities of the Buddha. The same with the qualities of the Dharma. The Buddha said you take the Dharma as your mainstay. You do that in the practice of mindfulness, like we're doing right now. You stay focused, say, on the breath in and of itself. You're ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. And although here there may be less of a sense of I, I, I doing it, still the Buddha talks in those terms. If you notice that there's a hindrance in the mind, you say, this hindrance is present within me. When there's not there, you say, this, present, this hindrance is not present within me. There's still a sense of self lurking behind there, helping with the work helping to make sure that it goes well. Because you are doing this for your long-term welfare and happiness. You're getting the mind established in such a way that it can see anything unskillful coming up inside. And it can get rid of it. That's what the ardency is all about. Mindfulness reminds you of the lessons you've learned from the Buddha, the lessons you've learned from your practice. Alertness is careful to watch what's going on right now as your breath is coming in going out. And also to see what the mind is doing, to make sure that the mind stays with the breath. And then if it's not staying with the breath, then ardency tries to bring it back and tries to keep it there in a balanced way, in a way that becomes more and more reliable. So that when you tell the mind to do something, it, it obeys. And this is how your mind becomes a refuge. As you point out to it that this is how true happiness is found by training, mindfulness, ardency, alertness. And so here, too, we find that creating a refuge inside comes down basically to being mature in our pursuit of happiness. The same principle applies to the Sangha. They develop the qualities of the Buddha, they follow the Dharma. They become reliable for themselves. And then we have them as an example to show this is how it's done. This is how it, and it hasn't, wasn't just done in the time of the Buddha. Even up to our own time, there are inspiring examples. We have to rely on them, but we can't rely on them always, because after all, if they don't die first, we're going to die first. Then what are we going to do? We have to develop their qualities inside. So in every case, it's a matter of having a mature sense of self, or maturing your sense of self that you become reliable, that you become your own mainstay. So this is why John Sawat used to complain about this little drawing that you would see all over Thailand. They take the words for don't be selfish, and they make a 
look like a little Buddha image. The don't is the head. Be selfish is the body. He says, that's not really a Buddhist th thought, because the Buddha would have you look after yourself. Because the word for selfish entirely can also mean look after yourself. He said, you should look after yourself. The Buddha is telling you to place importance on your own happiness, because if you do it wisely, it's not going to be narrow and grabbing and greedy. It's going to be wise, compassionate, pure, a healthy self. This is why Lumpu would also say that even though the Buddha talks about many things being not self, he does point out that our karma is ours, because that's what we're responsible for. That's how we practice. We take responsibility for our happiness. And then we find as we develop skillful qualities and abandon unskillful qualities, we get to the point where we don't need that sense of self as the agent anymore, and then we can put it aside. In fact, that's the last thing that would be getting in the way. But you don't let it go until that point. Up to that point, you use your sense of self to make it healthier, happier, more mature, so that you stay on the path. You keep reminding yourself that you can do this. As the Buddha said, this is something human beings can do. If human beings couldn't do it, he wouldn't teach us. And we're motivated by what the Buddha calls the self as a governing principle. Other people can do this. We hear about the Buddha, we hear about the noble disciples. They can do it. They're human beings. I'm a human being. Why can't I do it too? Even though that counts as a kind of conceit where you're comparing yourself with others, still it's useful. It's, it's helpful on the path. So it's not the case that we try to practice without a sense of self. We try to practice with a healthy sense of self. And that's how the practice is going to succeed. It becomes a practice that we can depend on. We develop a refuge inside, such a way that we can depend on ourselves and the people around us can, can depend on us as well. In this way, everyone benefits. <laughs>